بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله في كل لمحه ونفس عبد ما وسعت وعد الله يا علي معلمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لسان يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد I'm um, very happy to be with you tonight. Um, may uh, these nights uh, be led to fruition. May these nights be blessed with fruition and uh, may uh, we be able to embody this knowledge in the most honest and most authentic way and uh, be able to build our lives on its basis So, we'll go back to the poem, we'll begin at the beginning and we'll get to where we left off yesterday. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Qala al-Muhammad al-Wadhu al-Ja'tara laqadu kattani alayhi katjara hamdan liman awjadana min al-Adam وخصنا بخير من لم يقدم صلى عليه ربنا وسلم وآله وكل من لم تمى يا أيها العبد الضعيف المذنب المذنب فاسقيح عقل الجنب أول ما على العباد قد وجد معرفة الباب ورسل انتخب فواجب لربنا الوجود إذا له ثم البقر نمدود وخلفه لخلقه ثم الغنى ووحدة مطلقة ولا عنا. So tonight, inshallah, we will pick up with verses 6 and 7 that we got to in the past. He says, Thus it is necessary that our Lord have one existence. Two, pre-existence, then three, everlastingness, extended to infinity. <coughs> Four, dissimilarity from his creation, and five, self-sufficiency, and six, absolute oneness, there is no toil in what God does. So here in these verses, we begin, as you remember from what we discussed before, with the first primary attribute of the Creator, and this is the self-attribute of necessary existence. And one of the main things that we do in uh, Islamic theology is to reflect on the nature of necessary existence, especially as the counterpart to possible existence. That we live in the world of possible existence. We live in the world where everything that exists has its origin in nothingness, and then existence is given to it as a gift of creation. And having those two possibilities of existence and non-existence, this then opens up to if you, the door of infinite possibilities. Not of every type of possibility, but of infinite possibilities. That's the nature of the possible world. The possible world, which is the realm of creation, everything in it uh, is a manifestation of will that delimits infinite possibilities, infinite possibilities in those things. So we reflect on the nature of possible existence, and this enables us to have a sound appreciation of the difference, the dissimilarity of necessary existence. فَوَاجِبٌ لِرَبِّنَا الْوُجُودُ قِدَمَهُ ثُمَّ الْبَقَلْ نَمْدُودُ um, Pre-existence, he has no beginning. This is the first of the negative attributes. Then everlastingness, he has no end. Uh, extended into infinity. 
then seven dissimilarity dissimilarity Al-Rina is self-sufficiency um, we use the word Ghani in Arabic of course to refer to a wealthy person we say that who is faqir, he is poor at wahada ghani. But again, given the genius of the Arabic language, the word faqara, if taqara, means to have need and to be contingent. And the word uh, ghina, the basic sense of it, is self sufficiency, absence of need. So the wealthy person is called wealthy as a metaphor because having the social nexus that he or she has, having the access to wealth that he or she has, they can usually meet their needs. They can find their houses, they can buy their houses, they can get their clothes, they can get their food, and so forth. But the basic meaning of rina in Arabic is absence of need. And this is why the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, Al-Ghani, is one of the most comprehensive of all the names of God. Because God is the one who is self-sufficient. He is Al-Hayyul Qayyum. He is the one who utterly has no need. Okay, and this is the fourth of the negative attributes. So last night we talked about dissimilarity. Uh, Inshallah, we'll review that a little bit, and then we'll talk about self-sufficiency. So again, dissimilarity is an extremely important negative attribute of God. And what it does is it closes the door to any real likeness, any true likeness between God and anything in possible being. He is utterly different. Everything that we know in possible being is in time and space. Again. That which we know about the realm of possible being is usually limited to the physical objects that exist in it. And these are all in time and space. They are all delimited in that. They are things like these flowers on the table that are still, and yet they can also move. You know, they today uh, are rich and blossoming, and tomorrow they will wilt. Okay, this is the way that things are in the realm of possible being. And God is utterly different from that. So therefore we say that you know, nothing that pertains to the realm of possible being is a valid or accurate description of him. He is not in us. He is not outside of us. Okay, that kind of a statement sounds to a person who does not know the reality of necessary being and possible being as a denial of existence. Because all things in this world have got to be either inside or outside. He is not physically near. He is not physically far away. We know, as the Quran says, that he is closer to me than my juggler bay. But that does not mean that he is physically inside of me. He is closer to the atom than the atom itself. He is closer to the molecule than the molecule itself. He is closer to the galaxy than the galaxy itself. This is the way he is, Azzawajal, with regard to everything in his creation. Yet he is not like his creation. He must be of necessity, utterly, radically, thoroughly, categorically different from his creation. So he is not in me, and he's not outside of me. He is not to the right of me, he is not to the left of me. He is not to the front of me, he is not to the back of me. He is not above me, he is not below me. These are not valid categories to talk about God. He is not connected to me, he is not disconnected to me. He is not moving, he is not still. If this is the sound, accurate, theological description of our Lord. And as we said last night, God is not imminent in a way that some theologies say. He does not indwell in the world, and he does not enflesh himself. There's no incarnation. He does not enflesh himself in certain people, prophets and messengers or others. Okay? 
And he is not outside the world. He is not transcendent. We talked about that yesterday. Because in the history of religion, many times, if not as a rule, the doctrine of transcendence is a doctrine that puts God outside of the world. That puts him above the heavens and the earth. He transcends. He goes beyond that. And usually in the doctrines of transcendence, God does not relate to the world. And he does not know particulars. And this is totally different from our view. And to us, this is a fundamentally flawed and viewed and, 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 and mistaken view of theology. So God is not beyond the world. He is not in the world. And God relates to every particular in the world as if it were the only thing he created. We know this, that he knows every petal on the rose. He knows every leaf on the tree. He knows every hair on your head. And again, if we think about that, and we do not have illuminated hearts, and we don't know the nature of necessary being, it's almost more than we can believe. Because for us, and even for our computers, these are not things that we can do. These are not things that are in the capacity of anything that is located in time and place. Yet, for Allah, this is easy. For Allah, this is the very nature of the reality of his being. And these are dynamic truths. See the truths that we learn in theology and we speak about discursively. But these are what open up the path of dhikr. You know your Lord by ibadah. I did not create the jinn, the spirits, and human beings, but that they worship me. As Ibn Abbas says, but that they ya'rifun, but that they know me but by way of ibadah. Because illa ya'budun, ya'budun here is a wasila. It is not the end. The end is ya'rifun, but ya'rifunani bil ibadah. That we know, and our ibadah becomes real ibadah when it's based on knowledge. That's why the first obligation of all of the obligations of the deen is to know God, to know God. And then we fulfill the taklif. And then the wudu becomes real wudu. Then the salat becomes real salat. And then also the dhikr becomes real dhikr. There is no dhikr that doesn't have dhikr. You know, that what do I mean when I say Allah Akbar? What do I mean when I say Alhamdulillah? What do I mean when I say SubhanAllah? And this you know from this basic theology. So Allah is utterly unlike anything in the world. And uh, so this is a very important <coughs> principle. And um, as part of this principle of dissimilarity, then we also have the issue of al-mutashabihat. And this is something we'll talk about tonight before we go further. So as you know, and as we mentioned last night, one of the amazing things about the Quran is that Allah revealed these verses of Ali Imran, huwa alladhi anzal al-kitab minhu ayatun muhkamatun hunna umu al-kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat. Fa amma alladhina fi qulubihim zayyun yattabi'una ma tashabaha minhu ibtiba al-fitna wa ibtiba al So God says to the Prophet in the Quran, it is he, God, alone, no one else, nothing else, not your thought process, you know, who sent down the book. Therefore, it is a great book. It is a formidable book. Among it, in it, there are verses that are muhkamat, Absolutely clear. La ilaha illallah, la Allah, la ilaha illahu. These are muhkamat. He has no shariq. He has no nadir. He has no shariq. Nothing is like unto him. These are muhkamat. Okay. They are the foundation of the revelation. They are the um. They are that foundation to which everything goes back. Just like the mother is the foundation of the child to which the child goes back for protection and for love and for everything they need. But there are other verses that are mutashabihat. 
In other words, they draw likenesses between God and creation. The most merciful has taken his position on the throne. So are we speaking of God sitting in a chair? And the chair is bigger than he? And does he touch the chair or not touch the chair? And where is that chair? Is it up there? Or is it all around us? Is it in my heart? Where is it? If these are mutashabihat. And we have verses that talk about the hand of God. We have hadith that talk about the foot of God. That the Jabbar will put his foot in the fire. And it will be then appeased. And we have verses that talk about the eye or the eyes of God. Okay, there are many mutashabihat. Even in the, sahih, in the Sahih Hadith, in the authentic Hadith, you have the Hadith that Yad Hakullah Ida Ithnaim. This is transmitted by Imam Malik and others in the Mu'atta. That God laughs or God smiles. The Bahik in Arabic just means to show the teeth about two types of men. One who is a Shaheed who is killed in battle by a disbeliever, and then the disbeliever becomes a believer and dies as a Shaheed. An amazing thing. An amazing irony. Yad hakullah ilayhima. What does that mean? God laughs. God is happy like you and me. God is sad like you and me. That's not what that means. The mutashabihat are the makhazin al asrar. They are the treasuries of the secrets of reality. You know, in this deen, we have sharia and we have haqiqah. You know, we have the prophetic law which is the great communal path that leads to water and that leads to life. Okay, and it is the outward ahkam that bring us all together and that enable us to live together socially, politically, economically in a dynamic way. To be friends, to be brothers and sisters, to be families and so forth, okay? This is the sharia. And then we have haqiqa. The haqiqa is the ultimate reality of reality. And this is all a part of the prophetic message. We have many witnesses to that, okay? But it is the prophetic method that the law is what is taught to the people because the law is the vehicle of salvation. And your salvation takes priority over everything. As for knowing the structure of reality, you don't have to know that for salvation. And even for you to enter into that, if you are not armed with the knowledge of the Sharia, it's very dangerous for you because you will misunderstand. This is why we say in our tradition, and this is a statement which, goes, which is attributed to Imam Malik and a great muhaddith of our time, who's also one of my colleagues and teachers, Sheikh Khaldun al Ahdad, may Allah bless him, he's one of the greatest muhaddiths of this time. I asked him, is this actually from Imam Malik? And he said, that we don't know, but it's from the Salaf. And that's the statement that men tashabra wa lam yatahakkaq tafassab. That whoever tashabra, whoever lives by the sharia, learns the sharia, holds to the sharia, wa lam yatahakkaq, but does not imbibe the prophetic reality about the structure of reality. They don't even taste it, tafassab. They will become fasid. Also, we say that whoever has sharia without haqiqa has riya. Whoever has the sharia, but they don't have haqiqah, they will have riya. Okay? وَمَنْ تَحَقَّقَ وَلَنْ يَتَشَرَّعْ تَزَنْدَقْ That whoever lives by the haqiqah, in other words, they study all of these amazing truths about reality, but they don't live by the sharia, they will become zindib, which is worse, the fasik or the zindib. The zindib. They'll lose everything. Zindib is like a heretic. A Zindib is a person who doesn't really, that they don't have a clear, um, definitive belief. They know lots of things. They're very eclectic. You know, they understand secrets of reality, but they don't have what they need to have. Okay, so that's very dangerous. We say that whoever has the haqiqah without sharia, they have nifaq. That leads to nifaq. Okay. That whoever takes on the sharia and who takes on the haqiqah too, then they have the reality. 
This is the way of the Prophet This is the way of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. This is the way of the Sahaba. The Sahaba do not think ever that they were simple people because they were not. The Sahaba were luminaries. They may not speak about things the way that later people will speak, but they have that truth in themselves. And the Tabi'un are like that too, the successors and the Atba'a Tabi'in. Okay, so we have Sharia and we have Haqiqa. Haqiqa is about the structure of reality. Sharia is about salvation. That what do I do that is pleasing for God? What can I do that makes my life pure and enables me to live with you and to help you and for you to help me? Okay, so these are very important things. And the Aqidah that we study here, it is all Sharia. That's why it's always based on Qatayat. It's always based on discursive knowledge. And that's why when we come to things like Mutashabihat, essentially we don't talk about them a whole lot. We will just say that there are two schools regarding Mutashabihat. One of them is Madhabu Salaf. This is the way of the Salaf, the way of the companions and the successors and the upright of the early generations. And that is a tafweed. That we accept these verses as true. These hadith, Yalhaqullahu ila ithnay, which is one of the most mutashabihat of all the hadith, and totally sahih. So we nusallam, we believe that is true, we accept it as true, we honor it, we love it, and we turn the meaning of it over to Allah. We do not interpret it in an ignorant way because the muhkamat dominate. That I must understand this in a way that is consistent with the muhkamat. God is not like me. God is not a physical body. God is not limited in time and place. And all these references, like to the coming down of God into the first heaven in the middle of the night, all of these are mutashabihat. Okay, so the way of the Salaf al-Salih is tafweel. We turn this over to God, tafweel. We turn this over to God. And Imam Malik is a very good representative of that. So when he was in Medina, a particular man from Iraq came to him and he stood up in his circle, which is not easy to do with Imam Malik because Imam Malik was like Umar ibn al-Khattab. He, he was extremely charismatic and he was also intimidating. He was a big man. He was a beautiful man. And he had haiba. You know, Sufyan al thawri and others have said, I've never seen a king on the face of the earth who had the haiba of Imam Malik. Haiba is, is awe. And, and, and inshallah, I try to translate all the words. You know, um, I'm sorry, yesterday I used a lot of Arabic and didn't translate it. And um, that's not good for the people who don't know Arabic. But the man stood up and he says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. What about this verse that says that the most merciful sat on the throne? He took his position on the throne. And there are different transmissions, uh, as Sheikh Walid knows, that the one I like is that Imam Malik said, Al-Istiwa'u raylu madhu. Some say Al-Istiwa'u ma'lu. You know, he says that as for istiwa, we all know what that means. It's not unknown. And he said, well, kayfu raylu ma'ku. Okay, but the how of that is not to be perceived by the intellect. This is method of the salaf. They don't say that, yes, he's sitting on the chair and it squeaks. No, that would be, for us, tantamount to kufr. We don't say that. Al kayfu raylu ma'ku. Who be that kayf? <laughs> Again, as we said before, the dissimilarity of God means that we cannot ask these questions. When, where, how, why, what? Those are questions that are meaningful when you talk about me and I talk about you. Or we talk about the sun, or we talk about the planet, or we talk about Gabriel or Michael. But not when you talk about necessary being. It is that being which enables us to ask questions. It is that reality that enables us to understand everything. Just like all axioms and all theorems of science. The axioms and <coughs> theorems don't have proofs. 
They are proof. So also necessary being is that way. It is necessary in the intellect. Al-kaifu ghayru ma'kul. Al-wal-iman bihi wajib. And to believe in it is obligatory. Was to add on the bid'ah. And to ask about it as you have is an innovation. It's a new thing. People didn't used to ask about that. Why? Because they didn't have to. This is really important because people like Abu Bakr and Umar and the Tabi'un, they understood these things. And we have people in Islamic history who understand these things profoundly, beyond imagination. You know, but that's not the aqidah, that, that is haqiqah. These are realities. So this is the method of the Salaf, you know, that we do tafweed, and that is perfectly sound to do. Some people say that's al-madhab al-asla. That is the path which is the safest. But only if you're not literal. If you accept these things as true, but you believe that God has a hand like I do, or God has a foot like I do, or that he moves like you move and I move, then you're in danger. And our tradition will say you're in danger either of fisk, and that's if you believe that he has a hand that's not like other hands, or in danger of kufr, and that is if you actually believe in tajseem, you actually believe that God has a body. Our tradition is extremely strict about that, and it's very authentic. Then we have another approach to these, and this is the approach of the khalaf. And the khalaf are people like Imam al-Ash'ari, Imam al maturidi And these are people who come in the fourth century. And they are people who live in a time when things have changed. And the era of the first generation is gone. And you have science, you have philosophy, you have speculation, you have also the influx of many new peoples, Christians and Jews and others who have lots of questions, and they're often anthropomorphic anyway. And so therefore, it's like, we have to talk about this now. And so the method of the khalaf is ta'wil. It is one of interpretation. And we believe that they did that with the permission of the prophets. That's what the biographical stories tell, that the prophet gave them permission to do that and commanded them to do that. And so they will say, for example, the hearts are between the two fingers of the Rahman. They will say that one of them is irada, one is power. And when you say, Ar-Rahman al-Arshistawa, they will say this means total dominion over creation in the name of mercy. As some of our scholars say, had God said, Al-Jabal al-Arshistawa, had he said that the compeller took the throne, then all creation would melt. Okay, so it's Ar-Rahman. God rules the world as the most merciful as the all-merciful. Mercy is the stamp of creation, and so forth. You know, so they speak of it this way, and we believe that this is a very valid way of understanding. It's nasiha to kitabillah, a dinun nasiha. This religion is correct behavior, sincere behavior, honest behavior, and counsel. For God, in that we believe in his tawheed, and we study about him, in a way that is authentic and real. And for his book, in that we respect it, we honor it, we study it, we learn tajweed, we do tafsir, and we also give the muhkamat priority and understand the mutashabiha under the muhkamat. That's nasiha the kitab And for his prophet, that we follow his sunnah, we honor his sunnah, we embody his sunnah, we smile. This is the sunnah of the blessed prophet, right? We smile, we are happy, we give bishara. We are not here to scream at the world. We are not at war with the world. We are content with what Allah has willed. And we are supposed to be big people, magnanimous people, understanding people. That's the way of the Prophet. This is nasiha for the Prophet. Okay, so the mutashabihat then are a very important topic. And one of the things that we can naturally ask is why are they there in the first place? Usually in the Aqidah we don't ask that question because 
Again, the kind of questions we have today are questions that are typical of the inquisitive mind of modern human beings, and also the cultural dislocation of modern human beings. So there are many questions that have got to be asked today that we didn't have to ask yesterday. One of the amazing things about the past in the Islamic tradition, for example, is that evil was never really a problem for us. Why that's true, I mean, that's an amazing thing. But if you look at Imam al-Ash'ari, uh, he deals with evil in a very simple way. And we will talk about that later, not probably tonight. Al-Maturidi, who lives in an environment that has Zoroastrians and Magians and Buddhists, he talks differently about evil because they have different questions about evil. And he will use evil as a proof of the oneness of God. al Ashari doesn't do that. But al Ashari also doesn't feel the need to do that. And I think this is also because of the strength of our religion. So that evil is something that basically we understand. We're here to be tested. And evil is part of that test. But today, that may not be enough. So today, we need to talk about evil in greater depth. And we hope to be able to do that in the nights ahead. But with the Mutishabiha, why are they there? Because there are very many. Why are they there in the first place? And the reason for that is because, again, this deen is complete. It is complete, and it has total sharia, and it has total haqiqah. It gives you the structure of reality also. And one of the things about the Mutashabihat, even though we don't talk about that in standard creed, is the fact that they embody the most fundamental haqqaiq of the wujud. They are not anthropomorphic. Because anthropomorphism, which is saying that God is like me, is totally false. But the reality is that everything in creation is a reflection of the names of God and the attributes of God. The tree, the water, the soil, the human being. <clears throat> you know, you are a manifestation of the name al jamia the name that brings together all the names. You are the son of Adam. You are the daughter of Eve. Okay, so you have in you the name al jamia All of the names are there in you. Okay, this is a reality that again we don't talk about in Aqidah because it's haqiqah. Okay, but these mutashabihat are there for a big reason. But to grasp what they mean, this is something that is beyond the interest and the capacity of most people. And to be able to talk about that in a meaningful way, you have to have proper training. And you have to be strongly steeped in the Aqidah. And you have to hold your ground. And you have to be in the Sharia. And it takes special ithin. Okay, but these mutashabihat are rich. And even the hadith, yadhaqallahu ila ithni. If you understood what that means in the eyes of the great masters of Ihsan in our tradition, you would be astounded. And they would say that God is not anthropomorphic. He is not anthropomorphic, not in any way. But creation is theomorphic. Creation reflects the glory of God. You know, the tree manifests the name of Razak, as we said yesterday. You know, it manifests the name al Matin. It manifests the name al Qaha. It manifests the name al uh, al Hakim, and so forth. Okay, this is the nature of reality. And this is why everything in reality is a sign that points back to God. So the mutashabihat requires this measure. And one of the great accomplishments of Islam in history is that we held the package together. The Prophet ﷺ brought us 100% revelation. 100%. You know, all of the things that he taught us are absolutely true. Okay? And then later on, as Islamic history develops, you have people that no longer understand this. You know, the, uh, the, the, the rise of innovations in Islamic history, the rise of sectarian moments, 
is always because of people who see contradictions in the religion. Um, in the early history of Islam, the Mu'tazila are an example of that. They are the classical example of that. And the Mu'tazila are often referred to as rationalists. Okay? They are not rationalists. The Mu'tazila were men and women who had an extremely literal and an extremely uh, short-sighted vision of language and of reason. And for them, for example, vision is what you and I are doing right now. So if I see God, he must be a body, and he's not a body, so we cannot see God. And if speech is an attribute of God, and God is eternal, then speech is what you and I are practicing right now. That I am speaking to you, and you're receiving the message, and I'm using letters, and they're coming from my heart, and we're using a language, English. So speech must be temporal. It's got to be in time and space, and this cannot be the attribute. This is the nature of their rationalism. And they saw immense contradictions in the religion. And then they sought to set it right. And they called themselves the people of al adli wa tawheed They called themselves the people of justice and of the oneness of God. And uh, the great imams of Islam then come to respond to them. The Ash'avis, the Maturidis in particular, and they are rationalists. They are rationalists because they are the ones who invoke human reason with great enlightenment. One of the greatest things they do is to show, like we talked in response to the question yesterday, that human language has many meanings. And that kalam, as it refers to Allah, does not refer to the same thing that I am doing. Just like vision doesn't mean this, and hearing doesn't mean this. This enables me to taste the meaning of God's vision, to taste the meaning of God's hearing. The knowledge I have enables me to relate to the knowledge of God, not to fathom it. But what these words mean with regard to God is unique. And in fact, even if we look at Yabhaqullahu Ida al what is the Baik? This is the first meaning as it pertains to God, as a haqiqah of God, not as it pertains to you. This is turning everything upside down. And again, we don't talk about this traditionally in Aqidah because it pertains to Haqiqah. But in this time and place, I believe these are useful things to talk about because we live in the age of incredible discoveries, like quantum mechanics, for example. That we know in physics, quantum mechanics is the physics of the atom. And many of you know this much better than I do, but what quantum mechanics has shown us in the modern age is that when we get down to the molecular and atomic level of reality, cause and effect don't work the same anymore. Even in, a, in Newtonian physics, in Newtonian physics, Newton had a dichotomy. Newtonian physics is based on a dichotomy between two things, which are the point and the wave. Everything in Newtonian physics is based on waves and points. And then you look at an electron, is this a point? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? It combines both in quantum mechanics. These are amazing things. And this is where we have resources that are beyond imagination. We are people who, if we will imbibe our tradition, we can make science in the modern day grow. We can make sense of things. We can put everything together. Uh, one of the great things about the Islamic tradition is that we were the people who were the rightful heirs of late antiquity. We were the people who had the power to root knowledge. This is what Muslims do in the first, second, third, and fourth <coughs> centuries of our history. In, a, in mathematics, for example, mathematics is one of the last things to flourish in Islamic history. You know, it, it does it amazingly. And we take mathematics from everywhere in the world. We take it from the Greeks, 
We take it from the rabbis. We take it from the Magians and the Zoroastrians. We take it from the Hindus. We take it from everywhere we can get it. And then we synthesize it, especially in the 5th and the 6th century, you know, with uh, algebra, with number theory, with incredible things. Okay, all of this, though, is part of the rooting of knowledge. And one of the most important things in the modern age is to root modern knowledge. That means to relate everything that we know in anthropology, <coughs> sociology, physics, botany, chemistry, history, to basic propositions of knowledge that pertain to everything across the board, and to teach knowledge to speak the same language. So that in physics, we can speak the language of anthropology, and in chemistry, we can speak the language of physics. This is the Islamic tradition. But in order to do that, you have to understand the haqqaiq, and you have to understand how they relate to the source of knowledge. So today, these things, I believe, are extremely valuable. So the mutashabihat, then, are a very important part of our religion. And people like the Mu'tazila, one of their desires was essentially to wipe the slate clean of these contradictions. And our scholars refused to do that. They said, no, we will keep this legacy intact the way that we received it from the Prophet, and we will explain it to you discursively as far as we can go. But there is also something beyond that, which is much more profound. This is what Imam al Ash'ari would say, there is aqidah and there is aqidah. There is this basic creed which I am teaching you, and then there is a deeper and more profound one that opens out, out of that. Did you have a question? Um, what is the meaning of discursive? Sorry? Discursive? So what is the meaning of discursive knowledge? Do you remember? As we said, we're talking about discursive knowledge. What do you mean by that? Right. So this is knowledge that we can discuss with everybody. So it's basically knowledge that is based in an examination of the world that all of us agree that we experience. The world of physical objects and bodies. The world that we know through empirical study and that we know through reason and that we know through revelation. That's the way we describe it. Because even in the revelation, whether the people believe in it or not, it is there. You can read it and we can explain it to you. Okay, but then there are other things like the hapa'im that are not discursive. These are things which are there only for certain men and women who are capable of understanding them. And they are usually a small group of people. Okay, but we live in a time really where modern science has done amazing things. And where it has always come to the point where it knocks on the door of Hapayuk. You know, this is the expansion theory of the universe. Isn't that amazing? You have this huge universe expanding at the speed of light, going faster the further away you get, and it comes from one point. What an amazing you know, opposition. This is Hapaya. And we have also, we talked about thermodynamics. It's maybe a little bit less traumatic, but it's just as real. And then we talk about the atom, atomic theory, DNA, quantum mechanics. And we can go on and on. You know, modern scientists have worked really hard. You know, they are people that have worked like monks in the monastery doing nothing but that. And so therefore they come, they discover, they come to the doors, you know, of reality. Okay, so now we want to take the fourth negative attribute, which is al rina Okay, so he says, um, um, dissimilarity from his creation, then self-sufficiency. And among the names of God, Azzawajal, is Al-Ghani. He is the one who is utterly without need. He's not the rich. He is the one who makes the rich rich. He is the one who is utterly beyond need. And he is the Mubani. He is the one who can enrich you. He can give you eyes to see, ears to hear, you know, hands to work, feet to walk, all of the things that you need. And he is al-Qayyum, 
He is the one who is the support of creation, the supporter of creation, who needs nothing. He is the one who is self-sufficient, existing in himself and of himself. He is a summit. He is the one upon which everything depends. Everything goes upon back to him, and he relies on nothing. He needs nothing else. This is among the most general and the most uh, inclusive of all the attributes of God. And when we talk about these negative attributes, often you'll see some repetition, because in a way, each of them is uh, a corollary of the other. A corollary is a natural consequence of the other. All of these are explanations of the meaning of necessary being, of perfect being, the being of God. As we said before, based on the hadith of the Prophet, that between God and creation are how many veils? 70,000 veils of light and darkness. Some say of majesty and of beauty. You know, the majesty of God, the beauty of God. And uh, you know, if creation were to perceive any of them, hear them rustle, it would cease to exist. And creation, this is why when we look at creation with the eyes of understanding, it is the sign of Baha. It is the sign of Baha. He makes it exist. He holds it into existence. He makes the atom exist. He holds it into existence. And th this is the reality of that. We say in our tradition that the common human being who believes in God, you know, for them, these things are real. And they are real. And they're certainly real for you and me, right? The mirror is real. The wood is real. You know, you are real. For the average human being, these are real. And belief in God is a philosophical proposition. And if they're blessed people, they believe that it's true. There is a God. Okay, but it's essentially, this is the thing that has to be proven. And they say that for the believer who has knowledge, who has knowledge of God, and who imbibes these truths that we are talking about, these fundamentals, God is the real. And all of these things that exist are philosophical propositions. That how can the atom exist in this tiny little nucleus Surrounded by the field of the electrons, you know, which are so huge, as we said before, it's like if you make the electron, you make the nucleus a tennis ball, and you want to make the atom to size, the orbit of the electrons will be like two football fields. And the electron, which is a dot, and that goes around the nucleus this way and that way, 10 billion times in one millionth of a second, it is empty. But the fact that the electron is going around it at the speed of light, this makes it seem like matter. It's all empty. It's all empty. And it gives it weight because there are, there's so much in the nucleus, there's so many electrons and so forth. How can that be? How can this created thing exists for one second. In one millionth of each second, the electron is going 10 billion times around the nucleus. This is a miracle. And this is Baha. This is the sign of al Baha. He is the one who makes reality perfect. From the atom to the molecule to the DNA to everything that is there in creation. And all of these things glorify his praises. All of these things to send you who be And by their virtue, by their mere existence, not to speak by, not to mention the fact that they actually do that in reality. That's what we believe. You know, so the world we live in is absolutely amazing. And when we wake up to that, then God becomes the reality. And then the world becomes the amazing thing that needs to have explanation. And it does. It has to be explained. This is why they say that the person who doesn't believe, this is what some Christian theologians say. Um, in fact, he is one of the famous Christian theologians of the modern age. 
Tillish, the Tillish, he's the one who says that. He says the disbeliever is a person who does not take reality seriously. The disbeliever does not take reality seriously. Because how can this exist? Again, as we said before, man la wujuda, ma la wujuda li dhatihi min dhatihi, ta wujudu la la wa'ainun muhari. That which has no existence for its essence, of its essence, its existence is impossible if it were not for him, for God who is the necessary being, who explains everything. That's the truth. It's simple. It's absolutely, there's no question about that. So when we know that, then God, Al-Haq, he is the one that dominates everything. And this is why in our tradition we speak of men and women, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, you know, who see God first and they see creation second. We don't mean that they see God as a body or as something that imposes itself in between. But we mean that they have eyes that see this truth. And, you know, this is waking up. You know, Oh God, wake up our hearts for you. And, you know, um, let us come out of this negligence the sleep that we're in, you know, and, and really life is beautiful and it's amazing. So we ask Allah to enable us to understand these things. But al-ghina, self-sufficiency, this is a huge attribute of God, and this means many things. But again, our scholars, they're really amazing men and women. You know, they get things down to the basics. So. They will say that the basic meaning of rina, of God's self-sufficiency, <coughs> of his pioneer, you know, of his um, you know, self-existence in creation, is the fact that he does not need a locus. Do you remember what locus means? We talked about that before, right? Do you remember what word we're translating in Arabic? <laughs> locus. <laughs> Close. Mahal is the same thing. But mahal is what they say. The mahal. So we talk about mahal and we talk about makan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the mahal of the cup is the cup. The mahal is the place of hulu. So the cup yahillu. Yani fi dharfihi. Fi hayyizihi. Okay, this cup fills the space which is itself. Okay, that's its mahal. Its makan is my hand. The makan is where it's located. Okay, so they say the first thing, that God does not need a mahal. Again, a very beautiful theological statement, meaning that God is not like created being. He is not like possible being. He cannot be located. He is not a body. And this cup needs a mahal. This cup is possible being. It cannot be, and it was not at one time. And it can be. It has kabul. It has the ability to receive existence. Okay? But when it exists, it must have a mahal. This for it is what we call sifatun nafsiyah. We said that existence for God is sifatun nafsiyah. It is self-attribute, ontological attribute. Because if you understand what we're talking about, and you do, then you cannot imagine God. You cannot believe in God. You cannot affirm his existence if you don't affirm necessary existence. Okay? It is impossible to conceive of him in any coherent way if you do not affirm that he has necessary existence. It's self-attribute. And there is no difference between essence and existence in this regard. That is uniquely true of him, not of the cup. Existence is not its necessary attribute. It is not its self-attribute. This cup can as easily not be as be. If it exists, its existence was given to him. And for it to exist in time and space as part of the physical universe, it must have a mahal. That's its first necessary quality its first self-attribute. And that mahal must have a mekan. And that mekan, and it must be in its mekan, either stationary or moving. And it's got to have six directions. The right, the left, the front, the back, the up, and the down. 
Okay? These are self-attributes with regard to the cup. They are necessary regarding the cup as an existent thing. They're not necessary in themselves because it doesn't have to exist. But if it does exist, these are the parameters of its existence in the real world. Okay? So, uh, God is not like this cup. God is not like me. He does not need a mahal, and he does not have a mahal, and he does not have a makan, and he does not need a makan. And I cannot do ta'yin and jihad. I cannot designate for him a point and a direction, because he's not to the left of creation, or to the right of creation, or to the front, or to the back, or above, or below. And again, we do not deny by that that Ar Rahman Ma'al Al Ash is And we do not deny that the Arsh, the throne of God, is the greatest thing in creation. Now, which, again, where does it exist? What is it? Is it Mulki or Malakuti? Those are other things. We don't talk about that in Aqidah. That's Haqiqah. That's really big. That's very big. The Arsh is a reality. Okay? But Allah is infinitely big. <laughs> okay, so again, this is the way that we polish our intellects. This is the way that we open the doors to our hearts. This is the way that we make our ibadah meaningful, our fasting, our praying, our giving zakah, our making hajj and pilgrimage, you know, our doing a dhikr, our thought. This makes it work. This makes it powerful. And this gives you joy. This opens your heart to what you were created for so that you are truly happy and you now are pleasing to God so God has no mahal he has also no makan he has no place he has no direction he's not to the right of creation to the left of creation you know, and we do not deny that he comes down to this first heaven he does the prophet said that but bila kayf this is Bila Kayf. Don't imagine that he's like Santa Claus that's coming down from the North Pole, right? It's not, that's not the way it is. And again, these are meaningful statements. They're not just because people are stupid, so we have to speak to them in simple terms. And we, we will allow them to be anthropomorphic. And that's not what that's about. Not with our prophet, and not with Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or Moses, or David, or Jesus, or any prophet before us. This is a very interesting thing. You know, um, the Bible is filled with anthropomorphisms. And again, you know, we've talked about the biblical text. The biblical text needs to be approached with great respect. As the prophet said, be very careful. Don't believe them to be false and don't believe them to be true unless they say something which is clearly indicated in our revelation. But the biblical text is very difficult deal with. All the letters are written together originally. There is no pointing. There is no fatha. There is no dhamma. There is no kasra. There is no dot under the back. There is no verse separation. It's like, where does the word begin? Where does it end? I can read the Bible in a way that's very different from the rabbi. And if he says something about Ismail, you know, that he is para, meaning that he is an onager, you know, like a, like a Zebra, a wild ass, a wild donkey, which are very beautiful in, in the wilds. I can read it differently, and I can say he will have many children. Because the same word, which is wafa, in Arabic it's wafa, in Hebrew it becomes para. It's the same root that Ismail will have many children, and he will. He has 12 sons, you know, and the sons of Ismail are very important in history. So we have to be very careful about how we read that book. Okay, but it does have anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism in it. And in the history of the children of Israel, you have two captivities. Do you know about that? You have two captivities. The first captivity is in the 8th century BC. And it is in the days of the Assyrians. The Assyrians, Sennacherib. And, and the, great, the Assyrians are very interesting in history. And they take all of the tribes of Israel and they enslave them. They conquer them and they enslave them and they scatter them to the winds. That's the end of the ten tribes. That's the end of the ten tribes. Then there remains, you know, the tribe of Judah, of Yehuda. You know, he is the son of Jacob. 
and who is the grandfather of David and of Solomon. And then they have a captivity in the 6th century, the Babylonian captivity, which is more merciful. But the Hebrew language is lost. Moses did not write in the Hebrew script that the Jews use today. Moses wrote in a script that is very different. It's like Greek and Latin. The letter O that we use today is the letter Ein for them. You know, Latin and Greek come from that script. And that script comes from Thamudic, the language of Thamud, which we know. We, we can study Thamudic today. It's very interesting things. But Hebrew is lost. <coughs> And when the Jews come back to Palestine in the day of, days of Cyrus the Great, who was one of the great kings of history, the great Persian emperor, who was a muahid, who believed in the oneness of God, he's an amazing figure in history, then Ezra brings the Jews back, Hosea. This is a very interesting story. We won't go into that. Very interesting story. And Ezra then gives them the script they use today. And Ezra also translates the Bible to them in Aramaic. Because they don't know Hebrew anymore. They speak Aramaic. And it's amazing how they do that, because he avoids every anthropomorphic reference. In everything that in the Bible today is anthropomorphic, he will translate it a different way. So that there's no misunderstanding, because in the real Hebrew, it was not misunderstood. But in later Hebrew, it's not understood anymore. So the Mutashabiha are very, very important, and we are able to preserve that. Yes? Um, you said that Allah has no dimension. Why did you say that Allah has a hard time by it? Yeah. You said that when you pray for Allah, you just made a. Yeah, but when it says, Fauqa ibadihi, what is this Fauqiyah? In it, uh, so the Quran says that Allah is the all compeller above his servants. So does this mean that he's physically above his servants? And if you read the tafsir of that, you'll see that it is not fauqiyat al makan. And it is fauqiyat as saypa. It is fauqiyat al qudra. Okay, and this, this is why the nasih of Kitab Allah is to understand these things in the tradition of tafsir. And if, if you study the tafsir, you'll see that very clear. This is done over and over again. And this is mutashabih also. وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَائِكَ وَالْمَلَكَ huh? So, uh, and this is very important in tafsir. That's a very important thing. Okay? Um, so also God has uh, no murajjah. He has no mukhassis. He has no one to grant a preponderance to his existence over non-existence. Okay? And inshallah we'll talk about this later. This cup needs a murajjah. It, its origin is non-existence. It now exists. It cannot exist without a sufficient cause to give existence preponderance over non-existence. We call that in theological language, tarjih, preponderance. We call that a murajjah. God is the murajjah. And it has a mukhassis that you have to have something that specifies that it will be a cup of this shape, red on the outside, white on the inside, and so forth. It has thousands of attributes, and all of these have to be mukhassas. They all have to be specifically designated. All created things require that. We will talk about that in detail when we come to irada, when we come to the will of God, the idhnilahi ta'ala. That God has no murajjah, he has no mukhassas. Nothing affects him. Nothing changes him. He is perfect being. He is total being. He is necessary being. He does not change. He does not increase. He does not decrease. He is the one who increases. He is the one who decreases other things. He is the one who changes other things. But he himself is totally unlike that. Absolutely infinite. Absolutely perfect as he is. Then we say also that God has no suffering, that God has no gharal. He has no gharal, which is personal interest, personal need. You know, who am I? I am nothing but a'rad and a'rad. I am nothing but attributes and needs. And I have a gharal, right? I hope that I'm sincere. But, you know, I need to have clothes. 
I need to have food. I need to be able to sleep. Uh, I would like to have your friendship. I don't want you to be my enemy. I have many abroad. I can't help it. This is the way I am. May I be sincere. And may we be people of nasiha. We want good for each other, even though we have abroad. This is why the person who is not properly steeped in the prophetic tradition, his abroad overcome him or her. You know, that I will get the best of you and get the best of them and get the best of everybody and be the leader. And, you know, you will serve me and I'll, be, and I'll do a good job. You can be sure of that, okay? Allah is not like that. No gharab. He has no personal need and he has no personal objective. This doesn't mean that he doesn't have hikmah. Everything he does is hikmah. Everything he does is wisdom. Everything he does is mercy. But he does not have personal interest. Is there anybody who would say that he does? Is there anybody who would say that God has an interest? In, in people's worship at least, I mean, <clears throat> right? Hmm? In people's worship at least. Like, such, such as what? If he asks us to worship him, then that itself, in, in itself is something that he wants us to do, right? But he wills you to do that. He commands you to do that for you. Right? Not So you don't make God, you don't help God, you don't make him stronger. Is there anybody who believes that when they worship God, they help God? Yes. Who believes that? Ibn Amina. They do. They do. Our cousins. And if they do, because this, this is one of the problems with rabbinic theology as it develops in history, that they were the chosen people. And that God faddalahum ala ala me. He did. He granted them Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the Asbab. He granted them Moses and Harun, David and Solomon, lines of prophets. He honored them greatly. This is Tafdil in their time. <laughs> then after that, he sent to them the Messiah. And the Messiah is Christ the Tiger. The Messiah cannot be defeated. The Messiah cannot be crucified. The Messiah in all rabbinic tradition is a deliverer and a conqueror. And Jesus comes to them as a Messiah just for three years. And then the rabbinic court judges him to be a heretic and commands him to be crucified to death. Did they crucify him? And again, according to us, they did not. And according to the ancient Christian tradition, they did not. Because in early Christianity, you have two schools. One of them is crucifixionist, that believes that Christ was crucified. The other one is um, docetic, D-O-C-E-T-I-C. -E it means they're mushabbiha. The docetic say, that Jesus Christ was Christ the Messiah, and he was never touched because he's the Messiah. And th these were Judaic Christians because they knew the Messiah. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, the Essenes, the Qumran community, which is an amazing community that was there 70 years before Jesus Christ. You know, they expected Jesus to come, the Messiah, at any time. And they knew that he would be a powerful Messiah, and they were ready to support him. And they knew that after he comes, comes the prophet of the end of days, who is the prophet of Deuteronomy, 1818. I can tell you about that verse. Nebiyan. That's what it says. Nebiya. Yuqimu Elohim. Now that God will establish among you you know, in the vicinity of your brothers, not from your brothers in the vicinity of your brother. And him you shall obey. And whoever does not obey him, and he will be like Moses, and he will not speak of himself, he will speak the word of God. And whoever does not obey him, I will take them to task. 
This is fundamental in the Torah, fundamental in the Gospels, fundamental in the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so he will come after that. And there's nothing in the Dead Sea Scrolls that even hints that the Messiah will be crucified. He cannot be crucified and be a Messiah. This is why Paul, who is a crucifixionist, he says that the crucifixion is a scandal. It is a scandal, which in Greek means a stumbling block. You know, because of the fact that who can believe this? <laughs> What Jew can believe that Jesus was crucified and still a Messiah? Because this is a contradiction in terms. Therefore, many of the early Christians, they are ascetics, and they say that one was crucified in the place of Jesus Christ who looked like him. All of the acts of the apostles that are not canonical, that are what we call apocrypha, they are books outside the tradition, they are all ascetic except for one. And in the Acts of John, John is on the Mount of Olives, the crucifixion is taking place, and he is very sad. And Jesus comes to him and consoles him and tells him that this, I am Jesus and that is not me. It's a very interesting story, and in our Tefsir we have extremely interesting teachings about that. Okay? So this is the reality you know, of Jesus. In any case, Jesus comes, and many of the children of Israel believe in him. The, the, the community that follows Jesus Christ in the church of Jerusalem are overwhelmingly children of Israel. And then, as the history of Judaism continues, um, God, you know, uh, God banishes the children of Israel you know, from Palestine, they are forced to leave the land. The Romans make them do that. And then you have the development of Judaism as a religion. Judaism as a religion comes after Christianity, not before Christianity. Okay? But um, in, in the history of rabbinical Judaism as it develops, what do they do with the chosen people? When they're no longer chosen, and when they have now become outcasts, and they have no land, they have no nation, they have no place where they can stay. This is the history of the Jews, the wandering Jew. You know, the paradise on earth that they had was Muslim Spain and Portugal during the time of Islamic rule. You know, what they had there, they had never before in history and never afterwards, and that's also destroyed. And wherever they go in the Christian world, they can usually only stay there for a time. And then things will change, justly or unjustly, and they will be driven away again. This is the reality. So what do I say about the chosen people? And you can read this in rabbinical literature. That's where I've read it. I'm not making this up. But the rabbis will say that God needs the chosen people. And that God himself falls because of the destruction of the temple. And that God needs the prayers of the Orthodox. And that God anticipates the prayers of the Orthodox. You know, this is a belief they have. And it's, for us, incredible. I mean, we can't believe it. You know? And in fact, I mean, you don't even want to talk about it in public, even though the people that we're quoting are rabbis. They're the ones who say, this is what they believe. And the Orthodox Jews in Israel you know, they don't have to do military service because the state needs their prayers. God needs their prayers. Amazing beliefs. But this is love. <coughs> this is the attribution of love to God. And maybe in Trinitarian Christianity, you might say the same thing about uh, the Son. You know, that God must send his Son into the world in order to redeem human beings. As if God could not do that himself. You know, as if that was not something that was already taking place. So uh, these are important theological positions. Human beings have a tendency in certain circumstances to attribute God to God. And we don't do that. God has hikmah. 
He has wisdom in everything that he does, but he has no God. He has no personal interest. We also say that he does not suffer. God does not suffer in history. Uh, things happen in human history that are unmentionable. They bring tears to your eyes if we say that. If we talk about the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, or we talk about uh, other things, the fall of Muslim Spain, the fall of Muslim Portugal, the fall of Sicily, you know, other things in our history, it's like more than we can bear, more than I can bear, especially if you know what was there and you know what happened, but God does not suffer, God does not cry, he does not shed tears, he does not make mistakes. Whatever he willed in history, however difficult that may be, it is part of the wise course of history. And inshallah, we will talk about that at greater length later. You know, one of the signs of God in creation is coal. You know, coal, this black carbon. <coughs> and you put that coal, which is only good to be burned, you put it deep in the earth, and you put it under thousands of degrees of heat and tons and tons of metric tons of pressure. And what can happen to the coal? It turns to what? A diamond. The most pure and the most hard of all minerals on the earth. That's a sign of God. And this is also one of the signs of evil in creation. And we don't belittle evil. evil. We don't talk lightly about what happens to people in history. The caste system of India. You know, what is the dominant religion of India? Hinduism, Hinduism not by any means. Hindus in India are not 5% of the population. Because, no. Because in Hinduism, the Hindus are the Brahmins and the upper castes. And the Shodras, the lower castes, and the, they are not Hindus. The, in, the, in Hindu nationalism in the 19th and 20th century, all of this was redefined out of fear that Islam would spread among all the Indians and convert them as it had been doing. But in reality, the Shodra, who are the vast majority of the so-called Hindu population, they are not Hindus. They're not allowed in a temple. You know, if they hear that that is recited, you're supposed to pour bo boiling lead in their ears. And then you have another 25% of the population who are called scheduled classes or in English, uh, scheduled classes. You know, uh, I've been to Orissa, for example. Orissa is an amazing part of India. And Orissa is a part of India that Muslims are not even 1%. But Hindus are almost not there. It's all scheduled tribes. Orissa is wild. You know, it has in it tigers and bears and snakes and robbers. You know, but most of the people there, they're not technically Hindus. You know, they are scheduled tribes in Shodra. You know, so um, uh, in any case, uh, you know, inshallah, I don't know why I was talking about Hindus, but you know, uh, God has no suffering. What was I saying about Hindus? Well, the caste, you know, the caste system. Was there ever in the world a systematic means of oppression like the caste system? Really? You know, this, this is total oppression. And, uh, you know, so you don't speak lightly about that. You know, but all these things have in them wisdom. Okay, God has no regret. He does not regret that he created the world. He does not regret that he created Adam. He does not regret, regret the fact that Adam ate of the tree. You know, there are no regrets. Everything that happened is perfectly in synchrony with the wisdom of God. God has no injury. You cannot be injured. You cannot hurt him. You cannot benefit him. Right? You pray and you worship, and God loves you, and he brings you close to him, and he treats you with fubble and bounty. You know, but you're not benefiting God. And if I should be such a fool that I don't mention him, and I don't pray, and I don't fast, did I hurt God? Absolutely impossible. Okay, God has no pain. God has... No pleasure like we have pleasure. 
Like he, he can be content with us and pleased with us. We can win his pleasure. But it's not like pain and pleasure that we know in this world. And he has no hurt. Um, God is absolutely uh, perfect in these regards. Okay? Um, so, how are we doing with time? We're going really slow. <laughs> I always do this stuff at all. Anyway, too, we do. But may, whatever we do, whether we get through it or not, uh, may we do a good job. And I hope and pray that we don't go too fast and you know that you're not lost. And I don't think anybody here is lost. And inshallah, you know, may we be able to review this and to understand it. So then he says, may Allah be pleased with him. So he says, an absolute oneness, there is no toil in what God does. So the la'ana, there is no toil, this actually refers back to oneness, because oneness means power. But it also refers back to hina, that God does not need instruments, God has angels, most angels are the vast population of the heavens and the earth. They are, they glorify God, they are perfect beings, they are there to counterbalance us who are sinful and forgetful, so they ask God to forgive us. They're, they're a very important part of the glorification of God as he deserves to be glorified in his creation. Okay? Um, but God does not need angels. You know, God doesn't have to have things recorded by angels. God doesn't need instruments. He doesn't need calculations. You know, his knowledge is direct, uncreated knowledge. And he has absolute oneness. Okay, so when we say that God has absolute knowledge, you know, we mean by that, you know, that uh, God is one in essence, he is one in attributes, and he is one in actions. Okay, so this is regarded to be Ashraf Mafi Admit Tawheed. This is regarded to be the most noble discourse, the loftiest discourse in the science of Tawheed, the science of the oneness of God. And this is, of course, the essence of all prophetic religion that God is one, that he is absolutely one. But what do we mean when we say that? We mean when we say that, that he is utterly one in his essence, in himself, in his <coughs> attributes, and in his actions. And this means that there is no plurality, there is no dualism with regard to God in any of these aspects. He is utterly, utterly one, there is no other. And one here, many of our scholars will say, is not numerical. Because God does not belong to a set. God does not belong to a series, such that we could say one, two, three. He has no genre, he has no species, he has no phylum, he has no kingdom. He is utterly unique. He is al fard a samat. He is al wahid al ahad. Okay, so oneness is very important. And when our scholars speak of God's oneness, then they also speak it in terms of what they call ittisal and infisal. They speak of it in terms of what is connected to the essence of God or the attributes of God and what is disconnected. So they will say that God is wahid, yani, uh, you know, with regard to kulli kemmin mutasal, that he is one, utterly one, with regard to any kem, any plurality, any quantity that is connected to the conception of his essence. They mean by that that God has no parts, he has no body. He has no structure. Again, this is the definition of necessary being. 
You have parts. You have structure. You exist in space and time. You are big and little with regard to other things. This is a fundamental description of possible being. And we must describe God as not being that way. So God is not made up of parts. He is not structured. There is no plurality in the essence of God. When we talk like that, then we have to understand that we do not know what we are saying. That what we are saying is a statement of truth about God. But it is not something that you can fathom by any analogy. Because to speak this way about created things is to say that they don't exist. If this body does not have plurality, and if it is not made up of parts, and if they are not structured, it cannot be. God is not like that, but that does not mean that he is nothing. On the contrary, he is faster in a way that is appropriate in speaking about him than anything in creation. But he is not like creation. So his oneness is his secret. But he is utterly unlike created being. Again, as our prophet said, between him and creation are 70,000 veils. All of creation in big and small and multiplicity relates to him as if it were in a cup, as if it were in a thimble that you put on your fingertips. That's what oneness means. So we have to understand that properly. But we declare him to be utterly one. He is not composed. He is not structured. One thing is not above, one thing is not below. He is perfect being. He is absolute being. He is more, he is more manifest than anything in reality. He is more hidden than anything in reality. He is your Lord, who is your Ma'bud Bihaq, who is worshipped by right. Then we say also that he is one with regard to any kamin munfasil. He is one with regard to any kam that is disconnected. And we mean by this that in the world that is other than God, and the world is everything other than God, there is no other God. Okay, there is no other God. There is only one God. Okay, and this is something that we'll talk about again when we come back to will. Because when we understand will, there is no room in possible being. As complex as possible being is for another God. There cannot be. There cannot be. So God is absolutely one in his essence. His essence is not like anything you can imagine. It is not a body. And what can you imagine that is not a body? You are a body. You can only perceive by virtue of the fact that you are a body that perceives other bodies. Okay, But you must know that God is not like that. And this is what oneness means. He is absolutely one in his essence. Uncomposed, perfect, uncreated, unchanging. No greater, no less. And creation is like a drop in the ocean compared to him. And in all of creation, although creation is beautiful and ugly, and it has the greatest beings and the lowest beings, and it has good and evil, Nothing in all of that is anything like him. Okay, there is no other essence which is like his essence. And then we say that he is one in attribute. And we mean by that that when we talk about every attribute of God, and here we're talking about attributes like life, knowledge, will, power, hearing, seeing, and speech, that they are all one. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the attributes. And again, what does that mean? I affirm that it's the case. And I do not liken the life of God to any life. And I do not liken the knowledge of God to any knowledge. 
or the will, or the power, or the hearing, or the seeing, or the speech of God. But his speech is utterly one. His knowledge is utterly one. And this is what we'll talk about when we talk about attributes. His knowledge relates to absolute multiplicity. His speech speaks about absolute multiplicity of all that is, all that was, all that will be, all that will not be and could have been. Infinite. Okay? But that multiplicity is in its ta'alluq. It is in its cosmic relation to the world that it creates. Not in the knowledge itself. The knowledge is one. It is ahadi. It is wahid. His speech is ahadi. His speech, which is his eternal attribute, is not letters. It is not sounds. It is not Arabic. It is not Hebrew. It is not Syriac. It is not human language. It is not created language. And the difference between it and knowledge is that knowledge reveals and it demonstrates. Okay? So this is what we mean by oneness. And when we look at all the attributes of God, which we hope to do, you know, then all of these attributes, they must be understood according to the five negative attributes. So God's knowledge, for example, is pre-existent. It exists necessarily. It is necessary knowledge. It is pre-existent. It is everlasting. It is self-sufficient. It is utterly dissimilar. And it is one. Okay, and again, what does that mean? You know, as the question was asked yesterday, I don't know. But I know this is true. And I hold to this. And I will not violate that truth. And through the dhikr of Allah, and the fikr about these attributes, and the ibadah, and the tazkiyah, then I will come to be able to approach this reality. And this is what we call hana. Because when you realize this, you will cease to be. Just like the 70,000 veils. Between God and creation are 70,000 veils. If you heard any of them rustle, if you saw them, if you approached them, you will cease to be. This is what in our tradition we call fana. Okay? And then you come back rich to Baqa. Because now you've tasted something you can't even speak about. And now you relate to this oneness in a way that is absolutely authentic, but a way that's not discursive. That's why this theology is a theology that lays the foundation for infinite knowledge of God, for knowledge that grows and grows and grows, which is shajaratun tayyiba. You know, asluhathabitun You know, its roots go deep in the earth, you know, and its branches spread out in the heavens, and it gives fruit at all times. Okay, so God is one in his essence, one in his attributes. It also means that in his attributes, there is no other being that shares them. So there's no other being that has a life like God. There is no other being that has knowledge like God, uncreated knowledge. There is no other being that has will like God, power like God, hearing and seeing like God speech like God. This is the oneness. And then you have the oneness of deeds. And this is one of the most important of all things. Because it means that whatever happens in creation is the act of God. The fire burns by the will of the one. The water quenches by the will of the one. Causation is a sunnah of God. It is a pattern of God, of his will in the world. You know, but God is the one who is the actor in creation. So oneness also pertains to causation. And oneness also pertains to what? You and me, ikhtiyat. That where is my deed? If God is one, and he creates my deed, and he is the fa'al, can I also be a fa'al? And this is the issue of free will, which, inshallah, we will talk about later, if you permit that, because of the fact that what I would like to do is to now go through the positive attributes, and then when we finish that, we will talk about causation, we will talk about free will, and we will talk about good and evil.
Do you accept that? Yes. Well, that's what we'll try to do with that. And right now, inshallah, we will stop for the night. And tomorrow, ta'ala, we will begin to speak about the ma'ani, about the substantive attributes of God. Life, knowledge, will, power, hearing, seeing, and speech. Okay? So we'll start that tomorrow. And, and this is, and again, the negative attributes are tahliya. The net- negative attributes are there to negate everything that does not suit, that is not appropriate regarding God. And essentially it is to demark the radical division between necessary being, which is true existence, real, and is the secret that can never be known, and between possible existence, the nutshell that we live in, which is infinite. Creation is an infinite possibility of possibilities upon possibilities but it's only in a nutshell. Okay, so it's to draw this radical distinction between possible being that's in the cup and between necessary being that is separated by that, to use the words of the glorious Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by 70,000 veils of light and darkness. Okay, so this is tahliya. This is to get the conception sound. And then, inshallah, we do the tahliya, which is to speak about these beautiful seven attributes of the infinite attributes of God. We ask Allah to accept from us, um, you know, this is an act of ibadah, this is an act of dhikr, uh, this is a, it's the first obligation, it is pleasing to God, uh, you honor me in coming here, um, if I'm able to speak, it's because of you. It's because of the fact that you uh, are respectful and you want the knowledge. And so then we're able to speak and we ask Allah to make this meaningful and significant and beautiful and transformative and to fill us with the knowledge of God. There's nothing more beautiful than that. اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وتنظر وجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به وجعلنا نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعد متفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محلوما آمين آمين you know, many of our scholars, they say that all of the ummas that were before us, you know, that go astray or that are destroyed, they are destroyed because of the fact that they cannot keep it all together. You know, we talked about sharia, we talked about haqiqa, we talked about the mutashabihat, you know, we talked about all of these things. So that usually what happens in the histories of religions is that they will take one slant and leave the other. The Mu'tazila are the first attempt in Islamic history to do that systematically with the power of the state. And Ahlul Sunnah stood up and said, no, we don't accept it. You can kill us, you can imprison us, but we will not accept this. We will hold to the unity of the message as we received it from the Prophet Okay? And then you have other people who leave the Sharia and they take the Haqqiqah. So anyone who does that, then you're on, you're, you're out. You're out of the game. The game is over. And then it's usually only a matter of time that certain things happen and then the end comes, which could be destruction or it could be delusion or it could be error or whatever it is. But this is why it's very important for us, you know, to take this religion as its orga- as the organic whole that it is, and to preserve it that way, and may we be, this is the way your mothers and fathers were. This is the history of this blessed land. You know, there's no place in the Muslim world that has done more than Egypt has done, you know, for the prophetic traditions. Not just in the days of the Prophet Muhammad, even before that. You know, this is a land which is mentioned in the Quran, and that's not uh, an easy thing. That's not random. You know, this is a blessed land with blessed history. And we ask Allah to bring to life in this land that blessed tradition, which is merciful and beautiful and good. 
And all these things that have happened in Egypt, these are difficult times. These are very difficult times. We ask Allah to bring, to be merciful to us, and to bring that to fruition, and you know, to let Islam come forth before the world in a way that's worthy of our prophets, worthy of our tradition, that makes us proud to be Muslims. It doesn't make the world afraid of us. You know, that's not the way we're supposed to be. That's not the way we've been in the past. So we take a break now, and then inshallah we try to answer questions. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله في كل لمحة ونفس عدد ما وسعه إلى الله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تآخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق الحلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم So we take some questions في إذن الله تعالى and um, the first one says I don't understand the difference between oneness and dissimilarity so <clears throat> all of the negative attributes are different dimensions of the same thing. Um, they have specific uh, emphasis that they indicate, but all of them are negations of what is not appropriate with regard to our conception of God. And all of them are <coughs> demonstrations of necessary being. That God is necessary being. He is utterly unlike his creation. And so how do we understand that? If we were able to comprehend the meaning of necessary being, there would be no need to say anything else. So all of these negative attributes, in a way, are different dimensions of the same thing. And therefore, God's oneness is one of the most emphatic expressions of his dissimilarity. Because nothing in this creation is one in that way. This is one cup, but that's two, and that's three, and that's four. Okay? And everything that is in creation is in reality or in a potential a manifestation of multiplicities, infinite multiplicities. So when we say that God is one, we are emphasizing that he is utterly dissimilar. And we are also emphasizing that he is utterly self-sufficient. Because the nature of this oneness also is that it is manifest power, just like his self-sufficiency also manifests power. He who needs nothing can give you everything. He who has needs nothing has no ana. There is no difficulty with regard to him. So if you do tasbih, he can create for you a tree in paradise. If you do a good deed, he can create for you a palace in paradise. These are not stories just to be told to children so that they will be pious. These are absolute realities. Okay, so the oneness of God is an ultimate expression of his dissimilarity. And this is why also when we talk about oneness, we do not grasp what it means. I have to say that one of the necessary implications of oneness of God is that he's not made up of parts. You know, this cup and everything in the world around me is made up of atoms and molecules and parts, and they're ordered. And I, by experience, cannot imagine anything existing that is not like that, but he is not like that. 
And his oneness declares that he's not like that. Okay? And it doesn't mean, and again, we have to liberate ourselves from the illusion of drawing analogies with created being. Because when we describe God by these attributes, no beginning, no end, no cause, nothing that designates the way he is, but to, sp to speak like that about people who only understand the realm of possible being is as if you're talking about something that doesn't exist. Whereas in reality, you are talking about the one who does exist, and whose existence is Hak, and who is the real. Okay, so this is why also we ask Allah always, when we take this knowledge, that he expands our heart. And we also ask Allah that we are able to lead a life in which we pray five times a day, and in which we purify ourselves, and in which we eat what is halal, and we avoid what is haram, and we fast in Ramadan. When we do that, then we can receive this, and we can hold this knowledge. And this is why also when Allah wills to guide a person to Islam, yashrah sadrahu islam He expands their heart because the truth is huge. And then they can take it in. And then we live a way of life that makes it real. This deen is amazing. You know, I grew up as a Christian. And uh, we were Christians who loved Jesus Christ. And we took the church very seriously. And I memorized everything in the church. I knew the catechism of the church by memory. My mother could open up the catechism and ask me a question, and I could tell her the answer. And, um, you know, but all the time that I was in the church, I was an acolyte, I wore special clothes, I served the preacher, and so forth, I would go back to the back of the church and sit with my father. He always sat in the back row. I would go there, and I'd come back to the front to finish the services, and I always felt empty. That's the truth. I always felt this pain in my heart, you know, that I am not being fulfilled. That the, the priest, the pastor, he's doing all the worship. I'm not doing it. Even though I kneel, I sing, I pray, but I always felt empty, even at 10 years old, 11 and 12 years old. And then when I was 16, I left the religion. And I didn't come back to belief until I was like 21, 22. That's when Allah brought me to Islam. But when I came to Islam, you know, and then I was taught to pray, and I made sajda for the first time, even though it's very difficult, very painful, because your body's not, yeah, how can I sit on the floor? It, it burns my legs. Like I sat in tears all my life. Now I've got to sit on the floor. It's like it was so painful. You know, but the first sajda, it's like all that emptiness is gone. It's like, it's like, I don't want to even come up from the sajda. It's like, now my heart is fulfilled. You know, so, um, you know, this religion that we have is really <coughs> powerful. And it gives you the ability to take in this knowledge and to hold this knowledge. That's why, again, sharia and haqiqah. You know, this is a huge haqiqah. So we have to have the sharia. We have to live that life. And may Allah enable us to do that with great ease and great wisdom and great beauty. How do the three subcategories of Tawheed fit into this, like Rububiya, Uluhiya, Asma, or Sifat? Um, you know, the, um, the concept of Uluhiya, you know, in our tradition, is that God as Ilah creates things as they are meant to be created. This is the fundamental trait of Uluhiyah, that God makes the cup a cup. God makes the cat a cat. God makes the dog a dog. God makes me a human being, as a human being ought to be. And he makes every human being the way they should be. This is the way that Uluhiyah is understood in our tradition. Okay, and Rububiyah is the dimension of God that he commands and he prohibits. And he also guides and he 
Das Tarbiyah. He gives us the gift of education and of spiritual development. Uh, in the Quran, Allah speaks about the day of Alastu bi Rabbikum. You know, when God brings all of the human souls together, you and me, all of us together in the plain of Arafat, and He says, Alastu bi Rabbikum. Am I not your Rabb? Am I not your Lord? <clears throat> what does this mean? You know, we have known God from the time that he created us. And that world that we were in, which we know by Hadith and by the Quran, this was a true world. This is your identity. Your identity is always rooted in that world. You know, but in the world of God as the Ilah, you were as you were meant to be. And everyone was in ecstasy. Everyone knew God. Whoever they were, whatever their destiny was to be. But in Alastu bi Rabbikum, this means that I will now test you. It's changed. This is ended. Now the test will begin. This is your father Adam, and I will now test you, and I will command you, and I will tell you do this, don't do that. Eat this, don't eat that. Pray to me, fast, make the pilgrimage, and so forth. So Rububiya, as we understand it, is the dimension of Allah as the giver of commands, the maker of prohibitions, and then also he is the one who yahti. He is the one who gives tawfiq, <coughs> he is the one who gives fadl, he is the one who gives adab, justice as well. <coughs> and the asma and sifat, this is what we're talking about tonight. That God has these attributes. He has the attribute of existence, he has the negative attributes, he has the positive attributes, and he has his names. And all of these things we believe, and especially when we come to the mutashabihat, when God speaks of the hand, or the foot, or the eye, or the throne, or the fingers of the Most Merciful, we interpret that in a way which is methodologically and theologically sound on the basis of the muhkamat <clears throat> and not in a way that would ever contradict those. Uh, is it okay to, I think, to tasbih? Who wrote the question? In English. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So um, that's a fiqh question. That's a fifth question, and I don't really know the answer to that question. But, um, you know, as I recall in our tradition, you know, people that are unable to learn Arabic, you know, they have certain licenses that are given to them. Uh, maybe the fuqaha disagree about that, right? I know there are different statements about that. Could you help me? Well, what is the question? So the question is, okay, can we do dhikr, right? Can we do tisbih? Can we, can we say God is the greatest, glory be to God, and so forth, right? That's what you're asking. I think it's a very specific to the side of the Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so usually in the fifth tradition, this is a question about the way we pray. So, for example, if you can't learn Arabic, can you use English? Can you use Persian? Can you use Berber? And so forth. Or maybe you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything, right? Yeah, Malikis would say that, right? Malikis would say that if you can't you know, say anything, then you don't have to say anything. There are different opinions about that. Um, you know, with regard to the actual dhikr of Allah that we do, um, the Arabic language has a very special position. And, you know, one of the characteristics of the Arabic language is that the meanings of the words are manifested in the letters. And the words do amazing things. You know, so therefore, it's very important that we teach people as much as we can of the Arabic tongue and that we honor it and use it. Uh, in our culture, wherever Islam goes, 
we always enrich the languages that are there. And usually we raise up one of those languages that will become a regional Islamic language. So for example, in India, you'll have Urdu and Tamil in the south, and others as well, but especially Urdu and Tamil. These become major vehicles for Islam. In Indonesia and Malaysia, you will have Malay. There were also other tongues, but Malay was very appropriate for Islam. Uh, you have Turkic, you have Mandinka, you have Swahili, uh, Persian. Persian's a beautiful language. Okay, so we always enrich these languages. Um, you know, when I became a Muslim, my education had been primarily in history and in languages and literature. And I loved languages and literature, and I was especially uh, interested, and I was in fact studying uh, English literature in the PhD program. And one of the things that concerned me greatly as an English speaker was the fact that poetry was basically dead in the English language. Poetry that had flourished in the past, you know, in the 19th and 20th century, it's like it dies. T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Gerald Manuel Hopkins, uh, James Joyce, they all talk about this crisis, that what's happened to our language, where has it gone? And I was also very much affected by that. I mean, I was very concerned about that. When I became a Muslim, one of the things I felt is that if Islam ever comes to us, the English speakers, it will bring our language back to life. And one of the amazing things is that today, with millions of English-speaking Muslims in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, this is what we see. And we see poetry alive like I could never imagine 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So Arabic has, Islam has this ability to enrich languages and to bring them back, but always these languages become paired with the Arabic language. You know, so we cultivate Arabic, we love Arabic, we learn it, we also cultivate our languages, English, French, German, whatever they may be. But especially when it comes to things like dhikr, which is an act of ibadah, the Arabic language honestly and truthfully can do things which no other language can do. And this is why even we talk about the word Allah, which we talked about in the first lesson, you know, that we talk about the word God. The word God is, I believe, without any question, one of the ancient names of God. And it means he who is supplicated. That's what it means originally. Okay, but is the word God equal to Allah? I would never say that. Allah is very special. Okay, but God is also extremely blessed. And therefore, especially when we're speaking with English people or American people, often it's extremely polite and also communicative to speak to them and to use that beautiful word and to understand that it's the most beautiful word in their language. Okay, but when it comes to dhikr, uh, Arabic has a very special place, a very special place, and we all should learn, of course for you that's not difficult, you know, you're all Arabs anyway, but uh, especially for us in the United States, in Canada, learning Arabic is really beneficial, and in fact, you know, some of our scholars talk about the roots of disbelief, as Sibari, who's one of our great scholars, talks about eight roots of disbelief, and then he adds a ninth which is Mukhtalafihi. And he said it is ignorance of the Arabic tongue. Many scholars didn't hold that position, but some did. So knowledge of the Arabic tongue is really valuable, really valuable, and really essential to our religion. <clears throat> Doesn't describing God's actions as having hikmah require that they have ghara? And isn't the absence of a gharad a type of abath, which is muharab? Thank you. And thank you, whoever you are. So um, this is not what we believe at all. It's very clear in our theolo theological tra tradition that hikmah is one thing. Wisdom 
And we'll talk about this when we talk about irada. You know, that God, we'll talk about the way that irada works, that God selects of the infinite possibilities, of possibilities multiplied by infinite possibilities, those which are the wisest for this world and for the test that he has uh, willed for human beings. So hikmah is in everything Allah does. Hikmah is in every leaf that falls from the tree. Hikmah is in every step we take and every breath that we take. God does nothing with abad. Hikmah is, op is opposite is abad. Nothing God does in vain. Nothing God does is without meaning. And his sharia, the prophetic law, is all hikmah. It's all you know, jalb al-masalih and dar al-mafasid. It's all to bring benefits and to protect us from harms. But that's for you. That's for me. It's not for Allah Azza wa Jal. He has no gharad in that. He does that of rahmah. He does that out of fadl. He does that out of bounty. <coughs> so in our tradition, this is part of the distinctions that we make between words. And we do not believe that gharad and hikmah are the same thing at all. If we don't understand that tonight, it's because I'm not making it clear. And that's probably the case, that I could make it much clearer than I've done. May Allah give me understanding. May Allah enable us to teach this properly. Okay, that gharad is self-interest. It is self-need. That God needs that thing. He doesn't. Allah gives, and especially in our sharia, our sharia is filled with mercy. Why is it filled with mercy? You know, this is because of the fact that not only do we have the greatest prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, but we have the greatest followers that any prophet had. You know, that the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was followed by the best men and women who ever lived on earth that were not prophets and messengers. Abu Bakr, Khadija, Ali, Zayd, and Haditha, and so forth, these beautiful people. And, you know, we say in our tradition, Al-Bidayatu Majalatu Nihayat. We say that, uh, you know, that the beginnings are the manifestations of the ends. Al-Bidayatu Majalat. They are the place where the ends manifest themselves. This is why, you know, you always want to protect your beginnings. You want to do things right. And no matter what our lives are like, this is why we do Tawbah. Let me begin again. Let me start again. But the Bidayatu Majalatu Nihaya, in the history of Islam, we don't know of any religious community that received its prophet, that received its messenger or its prophet with the dignity and the integrity and the love, you know, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was received by his Sahaba. This is why you must, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, you must know the excellence of the Sahaba. You know, you must know that. And this, we are not exaggerating when we say that these were the best of people. The Prophet told us that. The Quran tells us that. Okay, so they were opposed by a very strong opposition, no question about that. You know, they had the likes of Abu Jahl, the likes of Abu Lahab, they had the likes of these other people, you know, that opposed them, but they were able to overcome that. And the Prophet ﷺ was able to bring all these people together in a remarkably merciful way. And although he is the Prophet of the Sword, and every Prophet is the Prophet of the Sword, even Jesus, Jesus says, I do not baptize by water, I baptize by fire and the, by, by fire and the sword. Because he's the Messiah. That's what the Messiah is about. That's why T.S. Eliot calls the Messiah Christ the Tiger. This is who Jesus Christ is. He's Christ the Tiger. He's a Messiah. And that's why he comes back a second time. Because of the fact that you did not accept me as any Israel. You were not worthy of me. And you tried to crucify me. God delivers him. And then he takes him up in the ascension, and then he comes back at the end of time. We have to believe that. This is true. All Christians believe that, too. We all believe in the ascension. We all believe in the return. 
crucifixion, the Christians themselves didn't agree on that. And if we study the biblical story of the crucifixion, you can see that they have no ilm, they have no definitive knowledge in that. None of the disciples could be there, because they were all <coughs> under threat of capital punishment. And not only that, but in our tradition, uh, the, the tradition which I believe is correct is all of them looked like Jesus. Because he put the shada on all of them. Some say just one, but the story that I personally am inclined to is that they all look that way. It's a very interesting story. Very inter and, and, and this is the Messiah. This is the promised one. Okay, so Jesus is that way too. And all the Jews who believe, that's why, the, why did the Romans care anything about the Messiah? You know, the Romans, the Roman Empire has 15% of its population, the children of Israel. And all of them are connected to the temple in Jerusalem. And why does it care about this man who's said to be the Messiah? Because he has a sword. And he will lead them in battle. This is what they said in their tradition. That's why if, if Jesus were there, you know, just as the Lamb of God, and just to give you salvation, the Romans would say, Marhaban ahna masahman. Jesus, that was not the teaching of Jesus, and that was not the belief of the Romans about Jesus either. Okay, but um, in our tradition, we receive our prophet beautifully. And of course, we have written, we have tests. We can talk about that. This is also part of the wisdom of God. This is part of the inoculation of the Ummah. That even though we disagree politically, we will not change the Aqidah. We will not tamper with our faith. Right? But this Ummah has a beautiful beginning, and therefore it has a beautiful history. The greatest agrarian civilization that the world ever saw for 1,000 years. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not saying that out of romanticism. I'm basing, basing that on historical knowledge. And then we have a low period, a difficult period. And again, this is in the last centuries, but I would say, especially since 1799, the day that Tipu Sultan was martyred in India, you know, the lion, of, the tiger of Mysore. Tipu Sultan, you know, was a great man, incredible man. And, you know, he was the one that he is really like, and I don't mean to demean any of the great rulers of Islam, like Sultan Abdul Hamid, but he was a classical Islamic ruler, the tiger of Mysore. And he really could outdo the British in everything. Um, he was also a military genius. He was also a, a, a revolutionary, you know, to empower the Hindus, to empower the Muslims and everything. And after 1799, when he is killed, I don't find the likes of him. It's like, that's the end. Then we go into a really difficult period. Tipu Sultan is the first one to create rockets of war. You know, the British, when they come, the, the general who defeats Tipu Sultan, who will he be in history? Do you know? You know, he was, it will be called the Duke of Wellington. He is made the Duke of Wellington because he was able to defeat Tipu Sultan. That's not easy to do. And then he takes the rockets of Tipu Sultan and the British begin to use them. In the War of 1812, which is 13 years later, when the British tried to take back the American colonies, you know, we say in the American, what is it, National Anthem, you know, by the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. What does Francis Scott keep talking about? Tipu Sultan's rockets. Those are the military rockets of Tipu Sultan, which the British had taken from him and they were using against the Americans in Baltimore. You know, but after that, the 1800s, the, the 1900s, um, you know, this is a really difficult time in Islamic history. And during this time, everything you can <coughs> imagine and not imagine is done to destroy this ummah and finish it. And yet, at the end of that time, we come into the modern age with all of our spiritual apparatus intact. We still pray the way the prophet prayed. We still fast the way he fasted. We still make hajj and pilgrimage and umrah. We still pay zakat. We still also know the tradition. You know, I mean, this ummah is amazing. 
But we have to be tested just like the people were tested before us. And so therefore, even as the prophet tells us, you know, at the end of the time, Islam will come back to its glory. And there will be generations which are similar to the generation of the Sahaba. The beginnings are the manifestations of the end. If we look at Moses, peace be upon him, and if you look at the hadith about Moses, he didn't like his people. And he loved very much us and our prophet. But Moses and Aaron are sent to a people who have been enslaved and degraded and who've lost everything. And no matter what he shows them, no matter what he does, it's like they never get it. You know, they never follow him. So again, the beginnings are the manifestations of the end. The end is very bad, and then you have a high period, David and Solomon, and then you have a low period again. We are like the opposite of that. You know, so also in this process, our Sharia is one that is very easy, because we were people who were ready to obey without any questions. If the command comes to change the Qibla, the Sahaba change it in prayer. No questions asked. So Allah makes it very easy. Whereas in the case of the children of Israel, they ask about everything. You know, about the Maqam. <coughs> and then it becomes difficult and difficult. Their, their Sharia is really difficult. Okay, so ours is very easy, and we ask Allah to make us thankful for that. <coughs> yeah, and um, how can we have a personal relationship if our actions have no effect on God? If nothing we do matters to him, doesn't he become an impersonal God? Okay, so we ask Allah to give us understanding. Um, you know, uh, we do not effect God. We do not change God. We do not affect God like we affect each other. You know, but we do things that are pleasing to God, that are accepted by God, and that open us, you know, to the guidance of God. This is one of the wonders of his relationship to his servants. Just as we can do things that close those doors. Okay, but this is about us, and it is about the way that we affect each other. The things that we do and how they affect those that are around us. And this is also about the issue of free will, which we hope to be able to talk about in the nights ahead, the Izni Lahi Ta'ala. <clears throat> but we believe that our God is a personal God. He is a living God, and He relates to us directly. And the, the, the relation that we have to Him is the most profound and the most direct that it can possibly be. He is closer to me than my juggler thing. He is not in me, he is not outside of me. And he is not an image that I can see. He's not like a human being, and yet I can relate to him perfectly, because that knowledge is stamped in my heart. Now, many things, especially to be people, that we heard those words in that place, and then also that we have this prayer we have this fasting, we have these asma, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, al-Malik, al-Qudus, al-Salam, al-Mu'min, al-Muhaymin, al-Aziz, al-Jabbar, al-Mutakabbir, and so forth. Okay, so this brings to us the reality of the one that we call upon. And then we study about him, we worship him, we draw near to him. He is an intensely personal God. But again, we do not affect him, he affects us. Uh, is the argument that the Atharis are the descendants, in a way, of the Salaf, and the Ash'ari Maturidis are the descendants of the Khalaf? Um, so again, um, in our tradition, we talk about the Aqidat al-Salaf, and we talk about Aqidat al-Khalaf. And we believe that both of those paths are totally valid. And many would say that Madhabu Salaf Aslam and Madhabu Al Khalaf A'lam. What does this mean? Uh, as you recall, this refers to the attitude we take or the position that we take about the Mutashabihat. So, do we interpret them or not? The Salaf say 
We don't need to do that. We do not do that. Nufawidu ilmaha ilallahi ta'ala. That is salim. That is a very sound position and a very correct position. And, but it is only salim if it is bila kayf. That's why we call it tafweed. We don't call it, you know, uh, you know uh, an understanding that is literal. We don't follow the zahir. But we leave those things like they are. Numiruha ala nahi alayh. We leave them as they are. Wunusallim. And this is a high position. This is, in the end, a'raf. Not necessarily a'lam. It's not necessarily the most knowledgeable in terms of discursive knowledge, but it's full of enlightenment. And in the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, they were extremely profound people. Whether you see that in them or not, don't think they were simple people. Uh, some people today, who maybe are simple people, they regard the Sahaba to be the same as themselves. That's not true. The Sahaba lived with the Prophet. They saw the Prophet. They touched his hand. They smelled his blessed fragrance. He looked upon them. You know, they were filled with light and understanding that I cannot imagine. And I don't think that you can either. You know, so Medhab Salaf is very strong, very respected. And Medhab al Khalaf is an ijtihad that comes in the fourth century because of the fact that things have changed. Things have changed radically. People no longer understand that position of the Sahaba. And there are now big fitness. There are batilis. There are dahiris. There are people of esoteric interpretations, exoteric interpretations. There are anthropomorphists. There are all sorts of things. So now it's like, don't say tafweed to me. I will say this means that. Okay? And so then they say, no, now we will do tafweed. That we will give you a valid interpretation of this for your sake. Not because that is the ultimate statement. Because it's not. The ultimate statement is the statement that cannot be spoken. It is the position of Imam Malik. It is the position of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. These are arifun, and also Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa is the father of the Maturidi school. And Imam Abu Hanifa in al-Fiqh al-Akbar and in some of his other writings, his aqidah is beautiful. And it is very much a Salafi aqidah, by the way. <coughs> you know, he's very, very careful in everything he says. But the, the Maturidis and the Ash'aris are really interesting to compare them. But the Maturidis are always very shari. Whereas the Ash'aris, it's like they're very haqiqi in many ways. But uh, the, the Khalafi position is a sound position. And today it is extremely useful to us because of the fact that we must make sense of all of this to the world. We live in a time where people have to know the structure of reality. In the past, the structure of reality is not a problem. Okay? But in the modern age, when you talk about evolution, DNA, you know, the expanding universe, point universe, thermodynamics, um, quantum theory, it's like I have to know about the structure of reality. You know, I have to know what to say about that. So here, then we have to get the full theological tradition. And in my belief, we have to even add to that. Because there are other things in the haqiqi tradition of Islam that now explain to us things that, I mean, why were they told in the first place? Because of the fact that today, I have to be able to open that door somewhat. And, you know, then, I mean, today, if we talk about things like maratib al-wujud, the different levels of existence, you know, this changes everything. And it's very important for modern physics, extremely important for quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics itself uh, is based primarily on the Buddhist concept of the eight. 
If you study the history of modern science, you'll see that. That the, the, some of the great people who've won the Nobel Prize in atomic physics, they have been inspired by Buddhism and its vision of the structure of reality. What about us? But well, we don't talk. We don't write. You know, and we are a sleeping giant. You know, and may we come to life, and may we learn our tradition, and we should be a vanguard in everything that we do. Be it ni lai to other. Um, you know, is that an adequate answer to your question? Okay, yes, me know. Um, if so, how can the aphorism be ex uh, extant today? How could they continue to be fulfilling for Muslims with all the questions, queries of the age without engaging in ta'wil? Well, um, again, you know, we'll be polite about that because um, in my case, um, do you have a question? Uh, in my case, um, one of the people that I love more than anybody after the Prophet وسلم, after Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali is Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. This happens to be my personal preference. And he is an Athari. He is a Salafi. You know, and but he knows what he is saying, you know, and I believe that he would be quite capable of explaining everything to everybody. So he takes this in and he holds it like that. And in my belief, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani and even Abi Zayd al Qayrawani and Al Tahawi, and there are many others, they take that position and it is Salim. You know, but also in the case of Sheikh Abdul Qadir, he is an Arif Billah. He is a great knower of God. And therefore, he knows what he's saying when he talks about these things. So I don't see any inadequacy in that path at all. But again, we do not interpret in that path. And we do not take things literally. But we understand that these are jewels and that they radiate light, and we let them radiate that light. Um, however, you know, when we talk about the challenges of the age, and we talk about modern physics and <laughs> astronomy and biology and bioethics and a lot of other things mm -hmm. like genetic manipulation of DNA, which is a horror. <coughs> it, is, it is genetic roulette. And all American, our American scientists were very clear about that. You open up the door to Monsanto to, to patent a type of wheat, you know, and to change the DNA. And even in the United States, whether you believe it or not, they take tomatoes and cross them with the DNA of pigs so that they have longer shelf life. I don't want to eat that tomato. I don't say it's haram, you know, but like, what are you doing? You know, you have the sunnah of Allah, and you have the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And in reality, you don't tamper with the Sunnah of Allah unless you have permission through the Sunnah of Rasulullah, which is the Sharia. This is really dangerous. This genetic modification of plants and other things, animals as well, is, is genetic roulette. And we have sicknesses today. And this is what the American government was warned about that what we know about genetic modification is that it produces sicknesses and other things. We don't know where this begins and we don't know where it ends. You know, uh, it's a very dangerous thing, but we have to be able to talk about these things today and we need to be able to talk about them intelligently. Uh, one of the things that we want to do in the United States, especially a man that I work with, uh, Maulana Al-Hafid Amin, who is a great scholar in our time, is to be able to talk intelligently about bioethics. He can do that. But we have to do that. Muslims have to be there. The Jews are there. The Christians are there. They talk about this with great sophistication. And a lot of Muslims who go there, you're embarrassed that they even showed up. They didn't even know what they're talking about. You know, so we have to be able to talk about these things with great sophistication. And therefore, we need to be able to draw on our whole tradition. Is that OK, or do you have something else? I'm just wondering. Um, 
What are you getting at? Same, no, no, no <laughs> I, I mean that with all respect, but yeah. has that tradition survived mm -hmm. in the same way that the uh, Asha'ira mm -hmm. and the Makhdoulis have survived? Like, is it transmitted yes. by Ethan? What does Musa Ferber say? He says <laughs> the Gathari tradition is Imam Safarin's, but I haven't asked him. Okay, so I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would believe that it is still alive. You know, and, and that's just my confidence, but I don't know where to look for it. I don't know who is the one who transmits it. Um, or is it the case that contemporary authorities are not really authorities, but are simply trying to associate themselves with that for uh, authenticity's sake? So do we have to answer that question? <coughs> Hasn't, do we have to answer that question? <laughs> uh, in, in any case, yes. Sorry, what, what, what's what he's trying to say is Salafi. Okay. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he's trying to say. You know? And um, that's what we're being polite about. And again, because um, I don't like to call names. And, um, you know, I don't want to make anybody unhappy. But, um, and, you know, we live in a time of great difficulty and great misunderstanding. So the best thing that we can do is to be brothers and sisters. And the best thing that we can do is to talk with each other and to discuss and to try to come to an understanding of truth. Okay, I want to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. I don't want to do anything else. And my brother and sister also want to do that. So let's talk about that. And let's talk about our tradition, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, Al Ash'ari, Al Maturidi, Al Junaid al Salik. And let's try to talk about it in an objective, honest way, with no excitement, you know, no emotion. And um, May Allah make that possible for us, because we can't be divided, we can't be fighting each other, we cannot be uh, ripping ourselves apart. You know, this is not good. This is not our tradition. And nevertheless, um, I had a great sheikh, and um, he, his name was Sheikh Muhammad Mahmoud bin Zidan. May Allah have mercy mm. on him. Uh, he was a Mauritanian and he lived in Medina. I knew him for many years. And uh, he's one of the greatest people I knew in my life. And um, he was a very honest man, and he was a great scholar. And I would go visit him regularly. Um, I would even give him part of my salary every month. I didn't, you know, I, Allah gave me more than I needed, so I could give him a certain amount every month. He was very poor. And at the end of his life, I came to Medina. He was in Medina. I gave him something. He said, after this, don't give me anything more. He said, I don't need it. Thank you so much. You know, I don't need it anymore. So I thought, you know, mashallah, maybe somebody now is helping him. He's got everything he needs. And then a few weeks later, he passed away. And he was sitting in the rolda, which he would always do. And he died sitting in the rolda. And then when the ziyara of the Nisa came, the visit of the wizard women, the police came and said, Ya Sheikh, boom, Ya Sheikh, boom. <coughs> and he's just sitting there. And then they go up, Ya Sheikh, boom. And then they found out that he's not alive. He's just sitting there. And he was a beautiful human being. And he was a Sunni of Ahlul Sunni al Jama'ah, but he hated no one. And in Medina, all the people that were in Medina, to my knowledge, they all knew him and they respected him. And that's why they left him. Nobody, no, he, he didn't, he, he was very beautiful in everything he said. But if you came to him, he would tell you the truth, whether you liked it or not. And during the Gulf War, um, I spent most of the Gulf War in Medina with him because, you know, our, I was a teacher and the professor, I was a professor in the university. I taught uh, Islamic studies and comparative religion. And in the Gulf War, the school was closed. 
you know, because people were afraid that there would be a bomb attack or something like that. So I went to Medina to be with him. And I'll tell you what he told me. So one of the things he said is, beware of the makers of claims. And he said that if you say you are a follower of Imam Malik or Abu Hanifa or the Shafi'i or Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you are safe because these are valid interpretations. Many Muslims today don't understand that. Uh, I've just written a book called Malik and Medina, Islamic Legal Reasoning in the Formative Period. Uh, it will be published by Brill, which is a good publisher. It's an academic book. Inshallah, it will be out in March. And um, if you can read it, it, you have to take a mortgage to buy it. <laughs> it's, it's by Brill. You know? I mean, I don't get a penny. They're Dutch. <laughs> you know, but they they charge an arm and a leg. Okay, but I went with Brill because they're the best academic publisher in our field. And I want the book to be read, I want it to be studied. So that's an honor for me to have Brill publish it. But this book is a study of why we have these different schools, what they are historically, and um, why Islamic law develops that way in the first 300 years. So if you're able to read this book, and it will be available on PDF, you know, then you could try to do that. I try to write it very simply. It's an academic book, so it has to have all the academic apparatus and footnotes and things <coughs> like that. And please don't be scared by that. I tried to write it in the simplest way that I could. But this is a very important thing. These imams in the Sunni tradition, you know, in the Sunni tradition, the definition of a Sunni is a person who in fiqh follows Abu Hanifa, Malik, Ash-Shafi'i, or Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and who in Aqidah follows Al-Ash'ari or Maturidi, or the valid Athari tradition, and who in Ihsan follows the way of Al-Junaid al -Sabiq. This is the way that we have defined ourselves for almost a thousand years. So that's not something new, even though today it is startling information for many people. And I don't blame them for that at all. And I don't say that they have no understanding, no. This is the reality of the time that we have. But it's very important for us, I believe, to understand the treasure of the past. This is the way he was. He was a Sunni. And he taught me many things, especially the Maliki school. And he taught me the Aqidah and other things like that. He was a great man. And uh, so in the Gulf War, we were all uh, you know, uh, affected by the Gulf War in a way that you can, maybe cannot imagine because many of you are very young. You maybe were not even born at that time. But the Gulf War, I mean, like this was a horrible thing. This was a horrible event. And we saw the occupation of the Hejaz. I saw the airplanes coming in one minute after another. That's not happy. That's not. The whole, the Hajj airport was nothing but bombers, you know. The airport itself was empty of anything but military personnel. This is not good, you know. So he said that if you say before Allah that I followed Abu Hanifa, or I followed Malik, or I followed the Shafi'i, or I followed Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and really these schools are rich and incredible. And the Hanbali school is among the greatest of all the schools. That I believe unequivocally. Okay, then he said, You're safe. You know, you will be safe. But he said, If you say you're a Salafi, and again, anyone who's here who is a Salafi, you know, I don't mean to offend you in any way, and I have nothing against you whatsoever. But he said, If you say you're a Salafi, that is a huge claim. Because then you're saying, I am like Abu Bakr, I am like Umar, I am like Uthman, I am like Ali. And he said, God will test you. And he will test you with a test worthy of the Salaf. If you tell me that you studied nuclear physics, and I want to employ you, right? 
I will test you to see if you know nuclear physics. Isn't that true? <coughs> so he said, they, and he said, this is their test. He said, this is their test. And he said, they failed utterly. I mean, the, the trouble that came after that, you know a lot about that. I mean, it hurts my heart <coughs> to even think about it. And again, we ask Allah to bring this ummah back to where it ought to be. And all of our brothers and sisters who want to follow the Salaf, you know, Allah bless them. Allah have mercy upon them. I want to follow the Salaf too. We want to all be like that. So we ask Allah to enable us to bring the Ummah back together. This is a time when we need to be able to unite and not to divide. But we have to unite not on the basis of slogans and not on the basis of politics, you know, but on the basis of understanding of the religion. And one of the greatest things about Islam is that it is a religion of toleration. Where do we agree in Islam? We agree on the qat'iyat. We agree on the muhkamat. And in the mutashabihat and in the dhaniyat, we have to have ijtihad. Okay? And we tolerate each other in that. Imam Malik loved Abu Hanifa. In Imam Malik, after Abu Hanifa died, he would receive Hamad ibn Abi Hanifa. And they would talk about his father and about his fiqh and so forth. Okay, so this is our tradition. You know, may Allah enable us to bring them back to life. Um, okay, so Dr. Sayyid Hussein Nasr in his book, The Heart of Islam, states that God was a hidden treasure, then he created the world. It seems to imply that he did this for recognition. Wouldn't that be gharab? So, a very good question. Um, you know, Abu Huraira, as you probably know, um, and I think we're getting late now, aren't we? So, should we make this the last question? But uh, Abu Huraira, he says in authentic tradition that I was given two wi'a of knowledge. I was given like two camel loads of knowledge. Um, one of them I exposed to you, and the other one, if I exposed to you, he said, you cut my throat. Um, that is an authentic tradition. What in the world does that mean? Um, we understand that to mean that the Prophet, وسلم, who did complete tabligh of the message, who delivered this message authentically and totally, he delivered the message of Sharia, of the outward law of salvation, and he also delivered everything that pertains to haqiqah. And haqiqah is the structure of reality. And the structure of reality is something that only certain people can understand in this life. Um, Shaykh Hamza Yusuf is like my brother. You know, we have been together this close for 30 years. And we went through the same things. We had the same sheikhs. You know, I love Shaykh Hamza Yusuf. And again, he is like my full brother. And, um, you know, we talk about things a lot. Um, you know, one day we were in a restaurant, and in the restaurant there was a picture of a tree. And then it showed the roots of the tree. And so I asked him, I said, where is the head of the tree? And he said, the roots. And I said, true, it's the roots. You know, and then he said, if you cannot see the world upside down, you have no permission to go into the haqqaq. That's what he said. Shaykh Hamza is an amazing person. So because like you have to be able to see the tree upside down. The tree is in sajda. The plants are in sajda. You know, their reality is in the roots. You know, and in any case, haqqaiq are the kind of things that in order to be able to understand them, you've got to be able to see things inside out. You've got to see things forward and backward. You've got to be able to see them upside down. Some people could do that easily. Some people, it's almost impossible. And this is not about salvation. In the end, all that counts is that I please my Lord and he forgives me, and I go to the garden with you. Whether I understood the structure of reality or not is not essential to that. 
Okay, but nevertheless, we come to times in history, I believe like the present time, where in order to have certainty of faith, we have to also have some understanding of the structure of reality. So this second we are, according to our tradition, and all the muhaddithin believe that this is a true reality, it has in it many things that may not be in Bukhari and Muslim. And these are hadith that are transmitted in a different way because they are not transmitted by the muhaddithin in the standard hadith collections. So, for example, you have hadith about Sahib al the, 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 the man of the time, and about the abdal, and about the aqtab, and other things. And this goes back to the earliest period. And the muhaddithin, like Bukhari and Muslim, they accept this. They don't believe it's wrong, even though it doesn't have a senate like the others have. And these hadith, like, Kuntu kenzen makhfiyya, فَأَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أَعْرَفُ So I loved that I be known. It was an act of love that I be known. فَخَلَقْتُ الْخَلْقَ فَتَوَدَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِمْ بِالنِّعْمَ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ فَعَرَفُونِ I forget exactly how the words go. Okay? So this is a hadith which we believe is from our blessed prophet. But it belongs to that we are. And uh, these are from Sudur al Rijal. They come from the hearts of people. Uh, the people who are given that by Ibn. And they are very profound. That hadith is absolutely profound. But it is about God creating as an act of love. Love to me and love to you. That he be known. And this is an explanation of everything in creation. And it is not God. It is fuddle above fuddle above fuddle. But again, it belongs to that other we are. Then we have hadith, you know, like, مَنْ تَقَرَّبِ إِلَيَّ شِبْرًا تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا وَمَنْ تَقَرَّبِ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ بَاعًا It's like this, you know, and مَنْ أَتَانِي يَمْشِي أَتَيْتُ مُهَرْوَلَ and so forth. And then, and my servant does not approach me by anything dearer to me than what I have made obligatory. And my servant does not continue to approach me by the voluntary things until I love him. Ah, love. Then I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, the hand with which he grabs, the foot with which he, and he, he walks. And he does not ask me, but I give him. And whoever offends one of my awliya, I have declared war against so what we are at, does this belong in? It maybe is in that other one, but it got in the vahir. Because again, it's like one of them feeds into the other. They're not contradictory. And it's again, Allah, the Prophet gave us in the wi'ah that is there for everyone, things that open up to the other. You know, so these are things, again, that we understand according to the sound aqidah. Very, very important, and they are the most beautiful treasures you know, that the Prophet has given us. And they are about the secret of wilaya, the secret of sanctity, the secret of sainthood. And this is, we believe in the Ahlu Sunnah Jama'ah, we have to believe in them. But again, it's got to be sound, it's got to be in the Sharia. So, um, this is a true hadith. Again, uh, if a person were here and said, it's not Sahih. It has no sound that we would have to say, that's for you, you can say that. Because of the fact that this belongs to the other wi'at. And that wi'at has its own rules. And it is not necessary or obligatory for any Muslim to believe that. And in fact, it is something that other Muslims often cannot understand. So we have many things that pertain to that wi'at. The Rijal al ghaib you know, the Ruhaniyin and things like that. And these are things that are there, and it is a camel load. 
you know, and Abu Huraira had that, and we believe that Abu Bakr knew that, and Umar knew that, and Uthman, and Ali, and others. And we ask Allah to give us beneficial knowledge. Allah muwaffiqna lima tuhibbu min tarda, wa ja'alna min adhidika su'ada, wa amitna ala kalimati huda, alimna ma yanfa'na, muwaffiqna lil'amali bima alamtna bih, wa ja'alna nahnu fihi, خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعد متفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما امين 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 يا رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم. ان شاء الله نلتقي يوم الاحد ان شاء الله.